Welcome to Design Speaks, the podcast that helps you use uncommon inspiration so you can overcome creative block and make better work. I'm your host, Brandy C. Joining me is my co-host, Julie Heider. This week, we're going to be talking about story brand with certified story brand guide, Eric Williams. Stay tuned for that coming up later in the show. Hi, Julie. Hey, Brandy. How's it going? Good. So we have a really special guest, but first I have to ask you, what is your favorite book? It, that's a hard question because it's hard to choose <laughs> just one. It is. It is. <laughs> so let me just say, like, what book have you read maybe more than any other book? Yeah. Okay. So definitely my top two. Um Pride and Prejudice is one that I really love. I try to read every year or every couple of years. Um, And then the other one, I'm calling it a book, but it's kind of a trilogy. And I know (laughs) you know where this is going. I know where this is going. (laughs) Lord of the Rings, obviously. That's just a classic. I know. Me too, girl. (laughs) Me too. Uh, it's just it's so good like I started I started listening to it on audiobook again recently yeah. um with doing lots of driving and stuff and I was just like wow I kind of forgot how amazing this is I just started the Silmarillion that one's intense it doesn't yeah. quite have the same cadence but yeah um Tolkien is my absolute favorite I would probably have to say that if I had to choose one book, I would probably categorize it similar to you, like The Lord of the Rings, probably yeah. by far. Um, I also just really love, I love stories where like someone overcomes something. Mm-hmm. Like nobody, <laughs> I say nobody, but if you if you know me at all, you know that I hate movies that like, they don't have to like have a happy ending, but where the ending just seems like life, like normal life, where it's just like anything could happen. There's no clear like Yeah, I'm not into that either. (laughs) Yeah, or anything, or even if it like just doesn't turn out the way you thought because it's like the story is driving you somewhere. Um, Except for, I will say, one of my favorite books is Ernest Hemingway's A Movable Feast, and that's more of just like a memoir. There's not any clear... I don't know, we'll say hero and guide and everyone will kind of get what that means here in a few. (laughs) But yeah, so today we're going to be talking all about why people love and need a good story. And you may be wondering what that has to do with design or being an entrepreneur or a creative professional, but just you wait. So (laughs) yeah, I I agree with you. And I, I do love a good story. And I love the Lord of the Rings too. So the song I've been listening to a lot this week is called Wish You Well by Club Danger. It is a sort of clubby type song and true to form for me this season, I guess, I've been listening to a lot of songs that have sort of lighter beats and kind of intense messages, but it's really it's really about like somebody who kind of did you wrong and wishing them well anyways, and it really reminded me of this idea that sometimes giving up on trusting people doesn't mean that you can't still think kindly about them, even if they've done something maybe professionally or personally towards you, that it's always good for you and your mental health and your your well-being to wish people well, to wish the best for them, because no matter what's going on, whether you've lost a job to someone or a client or a relationship, any number of things that Wishing someone well is going to be good for you and good for them. Forgiveness is for you and it's for the other person, but it's mostly for you. So all that to say, go listen to Club Danger. I really like this band and it was something that I think you should check out. So uh, Spotify playlist is called Music from Design Speaks Podcast and you can find this and all kinds of other really great music there. So I I don't know how much you like sort of like clubby type music I generally don't but yeah same really here <laughs> this one's really fun so they're very um anthem they have they have had a few songs that are um played before like sports sports games <laughs> sports games <laughs> <laughs> so what have you been up to Julie um well I've been in the garden a little bit um 
working on harvesting things. Ooh. Um, yeah, which is like I wasn't sure if we would get to this point. <laughs> of to harvesting? be honest, yes. Like I didn't know if they would survive long what enough. What have to... you? <laughs> what were you hoping you would harvest? What does um, the harvest look like? Yes. Okay. So I have cherry tomatoes. Um, that was a little bit of a mistake on my part. I won't do those again. Not. Uh, oh so, no! Why? I, don't, I, don't, I love cherry tomatoes. <laughs> Anthony and I don't eat tomatoes. Oh, <laughs> um, we we, we <laughs> wanted them all to me. We eat them like crazy. <laughs> yeah, we wanted um, a tomato plant to make salsa, but I didn't really think through that cherry tomatoes you'd have to build up a lot to be able to make salsa. I just chose a variety that works well in containers because um, oh. we we can't plant in our like because of our backyard and we rent and everything we can't plant oh, back there so everything's in containers got it. so I was like I'm gonna be smart and buy a variety that grows well in containers <laughs> and then I started harvesting them in the summer and I realized it's gonna take a very long time <laughs> to make some salsa oh but they're so good <laughs> I will say though so we pr- planted three different kinds of peppers and that has gone extremely well like my serrano peppers <sighs> The plant is like as tall as me, which I know I'm no not way, all that tall, that but it's tall? huge. <laughs> well, mine does. <laughs> I mean, you're at least five foot, right, Julie? Y- yes, five you're one. A- okay, that's a, that's a pretty tall plant. <laughs> it's huge. I mean, it's a little off the ground because of the container, but it's ginormous, and it's just constantly like it's been growing peppers for months, and so. Um, there's only so many things you can do with serrano peppers, I feel like. So I'm, I'm trying to get creative. I, I think can't we're even make tell you that sauce. I know what a serrano pepper looks like. So we'll just, I mean, it's like that. a classic little green pepper. It's really great in Indian food, which we cook from time oh. to time. Um, and yeah, like you can do some things with it, but you kind of use it sparingly in recipes. So, and I gotcha. have a lot of peppers. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, We are now, if you can't tell, we're basically just kind of wasting time at this moment. We're waiting for our interviewee to enter our uh, Zoom room here. So um, we're just going to kind of shoot the breeze here, I guess. Um, I have been growing things, and we have our tomato plant is blooming and flowering, but there are zero tomatoes on it. Really? Um, is it a tomato plant that needs to pollinate, cross-pollinate? You are asking the wrong person. <laughs> I don't know. What a, what would that entail? I, well, okay, so the reason <laughs> I ask is because I have a cucumber plant, which I almost killed during the time. We have one of the those, time. and it's doing great. <sighs> Everybody's saying that, and I'm like, oh, no. what about I mean, mine? So, like, half terrible. the plant died. Um, just from the sun because it was just like so intense, but the other half like grew up into the peppers. And so it's kind of using the pepper plants as a trellis, (laughs) um, but it's like shadier over there. So that half of the plant is fine. Um, but they've been blooming for like three months and I hadn't seen a single cucumber and I was like, what the heck? So I asked a friend who was harvesting cucumbers and she was like, well, there's two kinds of flowers on the plant, male and female, and they have to be, you know, they have to pollinate. Oh. Otherwise, you're not going to get a cucumber out of it. And mm. I was like, oh, OK, so I guess I haven't seen very many bees this year. So I I started doing the pollinating myself but with tomatoes I think there's some plants that like you have to have two of them okay to make maybe it that's, work maybe that's the deal so we've got green chilies growing green chili mm. New Mexico green yeah. chili we have poblanos uh strawberries raspberries and cucumbers <sighs> and the tomato amazing. plant is humongous but yeah it's doing absolutely nothing so we'll be we'll be happy to take all of your little baby tomatoes because we had one of those last year and that's all we ate (laughs) yeah I wish I liked them um I just keep putting them in a little baggie and throwing them in the freezer and hoping that they'll be okay when I have enough to do something with (laughs) (laughs) tomato soup tomato paste like the world's tiniest bowl of tomato soup (laughs) oh my gosh little mouse I was thinking like huh if I made some salsa it could just look like a little appetizer like on a a little just like (laughs) enough for one chip (laughs) 
I think you'd be surprised at how much they make when you have a bunch of them. I think that's true. I think you'd be surprised. Yeah. yeah I guess we'll find out. <laughs> yeah, I guess we will. Um, so you'll have to pardon for those of you who are maybe wondering why we are talking about this. I don't know if you <laughs> found this video and are like, what are they doing? Um, we are actually waiting for Eric Williams, who is a certified story brand guide. He's going to be dialing in for us to chat with him about what story brand is. And we have lots of really great questions to ask him. Um, he actually has helped me quite a bit with kind of crafting my um, my story brand framework since I shifted over from being a freelance independent graphic designer and creative director to being a creative coach and design strategist. Man, I can't even remember what I do anymore. <laughs> um, so he really he really helped me. I, I knew a lot about my client already. I really kind of had already gone through the process of understanding like what I wanted from my business and everything but he really helped me kind of iron out like some of the bumps and yeah figure out how I wanted to say things like on my website to really make sure that I'm sending the right message and communicating clearly so I can't wait to have him on here we you and I both love story brand we've been talking about it yeah. on and off as <laughs> Forever. long as yeah as long as I've known um about it. And so I think that I hope that people will get a lot out of it. And um, I really am excited to have him on. Yeah. Yeah. I think like knowing um, how to speak to your client and putting that out on your website and just like everywhere where you're, you know, communicating. Mm -hmm. um, it's so important to have a clear message and to know and it just like it takes the guessing out of it and then you know like you're putting out something that people can resonate with and mm -hmm. respond to instead of being like well i hope this is right yeah totally <laughs> i hope somebody connects with this yes yeah oh look okay so here he is we're going to awesome admit him and hopefully everything is working well we'll just wait a second hello hello how are you Eric, welcome to Design Speaks Podcast. You are oh, live on video me. and in our ears. That's great. <laughs> so we were just we were just kind of shooting the breeze a little bit and bantering a tiny bit about what story brand how important story brand has been to us, but we have not mm -hmm. really gone into anything more than that. So if you wouldn't mind, introduce yourself just a bit. Give us your little elevator pitch. Uh, well, my name is Eric Williams. I'm a story brand guide and I'm the owner of Two and Two Consulting. And basically what I do is I help people and brands make their stuff better uh, because we know that there's a lot of times where you are really good at what you do, um, but it's tough for you to explain what that is to others. And so I partner alongside of people. If you have a good product or a good service, we help you talk about what you do in order to uh, get your customers to listen. Man, you must awesome. do this for a living because you're really good at That's a, really a good practice. At <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, Eric and I met through basically through my husband. They they both work together um, over at Sagebrush Church on the creative team. I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you do there and what do you do as a story brand guide for creatives specifically? Yeah, so I worked for the last, I don't know, probably decade, decade and a half in uh, the ministry and church world um, doing marketing communications. And so, uh, you know, if you are a believer, you know, if you are a Christian, then and you kind of know that the uh, greatest story ever told, so to speak, would be, you know, the story of the Bible, the story of Jesus. And so trying to help other people walk into that and understand uh, what it is that God has called them to do. And so basically any of the ministries, any of the areas, we, we try and do a better job of uh, writing more compelling words and, you know, writing scripts and really just trying to communicate in a way that, uh, that really makes church tangible for uh, people on that aspect. But as far as working with creatives, um, whether it's a designer or a video team member, 
um, or even a speaker, if you're delivering a keynote or like in the church world, a, a sermon, you know, trying to make sure that the message that you're putting out there is compelling in a way that sets the listener up to be the hero um, of that story, because we're all walking around as heroes of our own story. And so um, however we can step alongside of that person uh, to do whatever it is. So if I'm working with a creative, it may be trying to help them um, understand the call to action that we have for them that particular week. Um uh, or the point of the story. Awesome. So we have briefly talked about what StoryBrand is and mm -hmm. um, what Donald Miller does over at StoryBrand. But if you would, for the the newbies in our, our listenership, just give us a brief outline of what is StoryBrand and why is it so compelling and why does it work? And then we have a lot more deep divey questions for you. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So story brand is really just following the principles of story, um, which are not new. I mean, they've been around for thousands and thousands of years. In fact, our, our brains are hardwired to understand stories. Um, and you know, that's true if you're in advertising, if you're in marketing or just listening to people that you like to be around, there's a certain way that we tell stories that helps our brains understand things better. And so story brand is a seven part framework. Uh, you can actually get the book, uh, if you're watching here, the book is behind me. It's a building a story brand, um, or you can sign up for, uh, an online, um, course or workshop where they will take you through all seven parts of the framework. It's basically, um, you know, Oh yeah, you've got it too. So it's <laughs> a, uh, it's a marketing and messaging framework that'll, that's going to help you clarify your message. So that way your customers will listen and engage. And it uses, um, you know, the basis of, uh, kind of what you would call the hero's journey. So if you're like a, uh, you know, Joseph Campbell fan or anybody, anything else like that, or if you take a screenwriting story or a screenwriting class, sorry, it helps you follow that hero's journey, mm -hmm. but in a way that helps your customers uh, want to engage with your brand. Ooh, man. I, I thought that was going to be longer. Good job. So <laughs> so just for the sake of argument, um, before we lose people that that automatically think, well, I'm not I'm not a marketer or, you know, I don't work at an ad agency and sure. are just ready to like click, you know, stop on this episode. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I'm not in that. Our listenership is primarily creative professionals, freelance designers. So. Before they stop this, why should they stay? Because how does this apply to them? So if you're a freelance designer, there's probably part of your, your job where you have to sell yourself to somebody else. And it's very tough to talk about what it is that you do because if you think about it, um, what you are not, you're, you're not really trying to be the best designer out there. You're trying to be the, the designer that gets the job right? Mm -hmm. You're the designer that gets the job. You're the designer that gets hired. You're the designer that gets more money for your job. You're the designer, the designer that needs to communicate the value that you provide to your customer. So I would say in general, I've worked with designers before I've worked with ad agencies. Um, and I think where we go wrong is we think if I just have the best product, if I just have the best service, if I'm just the best at what I do, then people are going to want to hire me. But we know that's not true because the human brain, we're not looking for the best. We're looking for the easiest to understand. And we're looking for the thing that solves not only my external problem, which would be, I need a new logo. I need a new design, but my internal problem in the way that I feel. I mean, you could just look at, uh, not to get too political here, but you could just <laughs> look at, you know, the last couple of years of presidential elections and think, mm -hmm. have we always picked the president, uh, the presidential candidate that is the best or is it the easiest to understand? Mm -hmm. And I Absolutely. could go through just candidate after candidate, candidate and show you where their differences in their marketing are and how that makes somebody want to choose them. So if you're a designer who's sitting out there and you've ever said, man, my stuff is better than so-and-so's, but they got the job or they're making more money, anything else like that, the reason is probably because you are not communicating to your potential clients what problem that you actually solve for them. You're making it probably more about you and how good your stuff is and not how your stuff solves a problem for them. Mm. Yeah. So uh, I have one more question then I'm going to let Julie go because sure. she's, she's probably chiming <laughs> at the bit. So in, in relation to that, so how might a designer figure out then what their customer actually needs besides the obvious? Like, well, they need a, they need a design, they need an ad, they need a mm. logo. You know, how, how do I figure out what they need if yeah. that's not what they need? Okay, so here's the thing is that everyone you run into, they have a problem that they want to have solved. 
So uh, uh, what we try to do is we try to solve that surface level problem. We think, okay, they need a logo. So if I'm your potential client and I say, hey, Brandy, I want to hire you. And you go, great, cool. What can I do for you? And mm-hmm. you say, I need a new logo. We got to start asking the right questions. And if you've been a designer for a while, you understand that. And you understand what it means to ask those questions to get the best design. But those questions start even before that process starts in your pitch Mm -hmm. to be able to figure out and say, hey, what are you looking for that new logo? Why are you looking for that new logo? Hey, what are some of the things that you've done in the past, right? Because then you're going to start to hear other problems. There, what Donald Miller would call the external problem is I need a new logo. But that problem is making them feel a certain way, right? They have something that they want inside of them. So like, I need a new logo and I need it fast. I need a new logo and uh, man, I've had some bad baggage with other designers before that have taken too long or have, have tried to shove something on me that I didn't want, right? Those sorts of things. I need a new logo, but I really want to be involved in the process. Those are three or four different clients that Mm -hmm. need three or four different pitches. And so really understanding that and stepping into that and finding out what those problems are takes a lot more work on the front end to really just ask and mine for those situations. Julie. Yeah, (laughs) I I see you. You're waiting. You're dying. (laughs) No, I think that's a great point. And it also um, kind of helps you separate from the scarcity mentality of believing that like you're in competition with every other designer or every other creative in your industry. Because once you start looking at the specific questions of your specific target market, you realize that you may offer the same service as someone else, but your people are asking, or they have other uh, like deeper um, issues that they're dealing with that you right. can help them with. They have issues. Um, and it just, <laughs> <laughs> it just helps, um, you know, differentiate yourself and not feel that pressure of, um, oh, well, everyone else is also doing logos and we're all after the same people. But when you really right. dig in there, you start to see that it's different people with different questions. Yeah. And you can, and it also helps you to say no to certain clients, yes. right? So every client isn't a battle Very at that empowering. Point. Because think <laughs> about that. Like if I were to come to you, Brandy, and I said, Hey, I need you to design me a new logo. And you're like, great, cool. And you give me your price point. And I'm like, Oh geez, you know, I can go to Fiverr and I can get somebody that's going to do it for $10. How many of us as designers or creatives have heard that? And you really, you just want to like, I know you want to reach through the phone and <laughs> strangle them. I want to go, but, well, you can, and you should. Right. Well, but that's the thing is because what you've realized is you are solving a different problem for Mm -hmm. them because their problem is I want something cheap, right? Mm -hmm. When you solve a problem, your problem that you're solving, Brandy, is probably something different. You want something that, yeah, yeah, you want something that transcends. You want something that connects. You want something that resonates, Mm -hmm. all of those things. But if I, as the business owner, I may not care because I might be a plumber and no offense to any plumbers out there, but like I might be a plumber and I don't care what my logo looks like because my name is AAA plumbing. So I could be listed first to the yellow pages. Right. So I just <laughs> what are yellow pages? Just kidding. Right, well, exactly. But, <laughs> no, fun fact. That's why if you think about all those different, uh, you know, I, oh, service I, know. Were a, I think a, about a. it all the time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, but then they go, well, I want a new logo, but what they're really asking for is I need something to slap on my truck. That's cheap. Mm-hmm. I don't care yes. about all the other stuff in your process. And that should be empowering for you to go, oh, then I don't need to do business with you. And that's fine because you're not my target market yeah. and I'm not, I'm not right for you. Yeah. yeah, we talk about, we've talked about before on this podcast. I'm not sure if it was, I think it was before Julie came on, but that there's no such thing as a client from hell. Um, right. It's just the, the wrong client for you. Right. And usually that's that's when you're you're not communicating clearly. So I mentioned just a tiny bit uh, before we you actually came on that you helped me kind of iron out some of the things that I I already kind of knew about but wasn't sure how to say them. So sure. how do you how would you say that like somebody that is kind of going through their entrepreneurial journey might be able to translate the story brand framework into like a social media strategy or a website sure. or, you know, anything more digital that they, they kind of have the opportunity to change on a whim and they can kind of yeah. get lost in that process. Well, yeah, that's a great question. Let me start by the first part where it's like, you know, you said that you and I have worked together to mm-hmm. help you. I mean, I didn't give you, I don't think I gave you anything new. It's just, it's all up there in your brain yeah. and you just needed somebody to pull it out in mm-hmm. a different way or even just to show it to you. Right. Cause yes. sometimes it's like, hey, I look, see this. this. Say, <laughs> right? hey, hey, look, look at this. And you're going, 
oh, I'm saying it that way, or just to repeat it back. Mm -hmm. And so in some ways, um, you know, this is what Leela Fever, author Leela Fever would call the curse of knowledge. <clears throat> it means that you're just too close to what you do. Yeah. So, you know, and the same thing that, you know, Julie, you were talking about is like, you, you can kind of be in your work and you, you start to think like, oh, I'm the worst or I'm the best. Like you just, you can't separate yourself from the work. So the nice yeah. thing about the story brand process is it helps you put down things, not from your perspective, but from your perspective, client's perspective. And that helps you to be able to separate just a little bit and realize that, uh, that I know my stuff, you know, your stuff at a level like eight, nine, 10. And the problem is your clients are making purchasing decisions. They're choosing a designer and they know about a level, maybe a two or a three about design. And even when you think you're talking about your offerings in a way that you're completely dumbing it down, you're still bringing it down to like a level six or seven. Mm -hmm. And it's still yeah. way over my head. So when you talk about kerning and typography and I say <laughs> font and you mean, no type, you know, and I'm like, oh, type <laughs> type font, face. Right? Type like, face. face, right? Exactly. Like <laughs> I'm down here. Look, I'm like, a I two. don't care I don't, at all. <laughs> I don't care. I'm a plumber. Remember? Like I don't, I just need something for my, so that's the thing that it helps you do is it helps you really take yourself out and say like, and here's the thing about creative pursuits. So designers, writers, videographers, artists, anything like that, like, I'm so it's it's about me because it's about my muse and I'm the oh, and I'm creating and I'm doing all this kind of stuff. But in reality, your client doesn't care about any of that. Mm -hmm. And so when you start talking, it's about me and it's about me and it's about me, it's about me, then they just start tuning out because they're like, oh great, I've just <clears throat> found a hero. You're a hero. I like watching hero stories, but what I'm looking for is I'm looking for a guide to come and help me. And so when you can start to reframe what you do in a way that provides value for your customer and your client, so don't say, hey, I've got the best looking design, right? I've got designs that drive sales, mm -hmm. right? I've got, I, I don't tell, I don't write stories. I write things that, that evoke emotion that compel people to make purchasing decisions. So if you're a client, what do you want to hear? A designer that's an award-winning designer or, does not, or a designer that designs items that sell, you know, that designs things that sells your product. Right. I want to hear that you design things that sell my product, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so that's how you use it to talk about it. And then that reframes it. So for your social media, and this is what happens too, you got to decide, am I, am I a designer influencer or am I a designer that actually wants to sell things and get my product out? Because mm -hmm. if it's about me and I'm an influencer, great. Be an influencer on social media. That's awesome. But right. then when you're wondering, why am I not getting new clients out of this? Well, maybe because you're doing too many about me posts. And instead of going, how do I provide, uh, how do I provide more value for my prospective clients? How can I brag mm -hmm. about not the design that <clears throat> I made? But how can I brag about how this design helped um, really resonate with the client's customer, right? And he really represented the client. So if I could talk through and I say, I made this design, here's what happened. I had a client come into me. Here's the problem that they were going through. Here's what they were facing. Here's how I stepped in and helped them through that problem. Together, we came up with this design and now we've, uh, now we've applied it in these ways and now their sales have gone up. Or now they've done this or they've done that. So you're talking about your client's success, but the key is you're talking about their client's success through the fact that your design helped them achieve that success. Right. Now, what do I want to do? I go, <clears throat> I want, want that. I want to hire you. How do I do that? Yeah, it becomes less about your ego and more about them. Um, yep. So, Julie, do you want to add anything before I can <laughs> move, roll over you? <laughs> yeah, um, I think that was one of the biggest things when I first found out about StoryBrand was um, it just like took that pressure off of like, I'm not someone who likes to talk about how great my work is. Mm -hmm. And so I just felt really awkward doing that. And I was like, how do I sell it without sounding right. salesy? And I just hated that. I don't like being sold to that way. So I didn't want to sell to other people that way. And when I found the story brand uh, framework, I was like, oh my goodness, this just like, it makes so much sense. Mm -hmm. And um, it just takes a huge amount of pressure off of you um, because it's not about you anymore. And it just makes it so much easier. And yeah. um, and anyone can tell a story. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just so easy. <clears throat> yeah. How many times have you felt as a designer that you're like on opposite sides of a table or a jousting match with your client, your prospective client, right? You're just playing ping pong back and forth. But in reality, when you can actually get together and look at the problem 
and you say, okay, what problem are you facing? And you could say, okay, and you stand side to side, shoulder to shoulder with your client. And now it doesn't become about your design. It becomes about the problem that you're trying to solve mutually. And so you can even use the story brand framework to help in that creative process with the client and somewhat to help convince the client um, if there is a design that you believe is really helping to solve their problem. Because you can start to talk about it in not ways that are designer speak, which your non-designer people don't care about, right. but you talk about it in a way that's going to provide that value to the client. And it's not about your ego either. I think that's really great. Yeah. So <clears throat> let's talk just a little bit about the the importance and the power of story in general and maybe explore a little bit about who is the hero and who mm -hmm. is the guide and what do these roles mean as a creative entrepreneur, as a creative professional? Yeah, so you can um, read more about the seven part framework in the book. That's, you know, it's super easy to be able to do that. But just a quick overview, you know, you've got the hero and you've got the guide. Every story has a hero and most every story that's any good has a guide as someone else that comes in to help the hero get what they want. So if you think about it in every story, you think about any hero, the best stories have heroes that are flawed right? I mean, we complain about stories or we talk about plot holes in stories where the hero is perfect and could do anything. Mm -hmm. Because the, the key is if you don't have any tension, if you don't have a problem in the story, a problem to solve, then th there is no story. Yeah. So you've got the guide, the guy, or I mean, you've got the hero, the hero has a problem. So the hero has to meet somebody that's outside of them in any story. So that's your Obi-Wan Kenobi, that's your Yoda, you know, Katniss had Haymitch or Woody from Cheers, whatever, you know, that guy. <laughs> so like you get it, right? I mean, essentially yes. Woody from Cheers helps her <laughs> overcome totally. everything. All right. So there's like an outside force that can help the hero get what they want. Now, here's what happens is as a brand, we try to pos position ourselves as the hero, but people don't want a hero. They, they want a guide. And we go back to the presidential conversation, right? We, we actually have people that run for office that are war heroes, that are decorated war heroes, mm -hmm. like John McCain. Right. Didn't win, right? Other people that are like that, that don't win because we're not looking for a hero. And again, ignore your political backgrounds, but- Yeah, no, the or, concept's with, the same. <laughs> with, if, you look at, if you look at with Bill Clinton, what was his main thing? He wasn't a war veteran. He wasn't any of that. But he said during one key town hall, he looked at a young woman who asked him a question and he said these three words. I think it was three. I, I feel your, that's four words. I <laughs> feel your pain, right? He the looked empathy. right at her and he said, I feel your pain. Mm -hmm. I'm with you and I want to help you. Oh man. And you could ask any political pundit. That's like where his, where his mm -hmm. candidacy kind of turned in that one. And so when you as a designer or you as anybody who's in that creative realm can step in as the guide and not the hero, you're actually the strongest person in the story because you are the one that holds the key to helping that hero get what they want. You are so, Gandalf. Yes, you're Gandalf. <laughs> or, or think about it. Like you're the best version of a parent. I mean, I've got two kids. I don't know. Do, do you, if both of you have kids? She, she has kids. a fur baby. Know. Okay. Yeah. yeah okay. Great. So like, think about this. I, I love being the hero, but at the same time, when I see my kids need something and they don't have it and I could step in and I could provide them with that thing that they don't have just the, Oh, the agile, you're the best dad in the world. Right. And it's like, <laughs> yes, because I had the power to provide them with something that they needed. I wasn't mm -hmm. the hero. I wasn't the focal point. Right. I was the guide that gave them the thing. It now, totally feels thing, better. <laughs> Yeah. And whatever that thing is, that's you're the product that you're selling. So you need to position yourself as the person who goes, hey, I see that you're struggling and I, I understand that struggle. And I've helped plenty of people just like you overcome that struggle. And I have what it takes to get. And that's where you show like all your, you know, your certifications and everything else. that I have what it takes to help you overcome that struggle. And right. that's that's where we get a chance to work together. Yeah. And once you know that, um, it goes beyond just your website and how you're talking in social media, mm -hmm. just having a conversation with someone. Um, right. I mean, I talked with a potential client today and the first thing we talked about were like the issues that she was dealing with. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I totally get that. I like, I'm right there with you. I understand you're not alone. And like, here's all the awesome things we can do to yeah. get rid of that stuff and make you know what your end goal is happen um and it was a really easy conversation to have now that i know that's like yeah. what i need to be talking about 
Exactly. And I bet if you have conversations with successful clients, like the clients that you love and would have again and again and again, they're probably not saying, uh, you know, Julie did the best work. I mean, they probably are. Julie did the best work and delivered this or whatever like that. They're talking about how you made them feel. Right. And that's what I want them to talk about. (laughs) I, you know, I don't care if they say like, oh, she was the best photographer, like Mm -hmm. whatever. That doesn't matter to me as much as somebody saying that like their, their fears were relieved that their issues were solved because I was there to help them. Yeah. I was afraid of this. Uh, Julie stepped in, helped me out. And this is what happened. And I, I couldn't be happier. Right. Yeah. Because again, they're not going to explain it at that level nine and 10 of whatever it is Mm -hmm. that you do, whether it's design or photography, you know, they're not going to say, oh man, the F stop that she used on that photo was just, (laughs) oh, it was the best. Right. (laughs) ISO was perfect. They're not going to say that. They're going to say, like, our wedding day was amazing. Right. We have memories to last a lifetime. That's what they say to photographers. They don't talk about your technical expertise. They talk about how you did what you did to make them feel better or Mm -hmm. to increase their revenue or their sales or whatever it happens to be, or that you were just quicker, right? Or that you were just nice. Like those are the things that will separate you that aren't necessarily anything to do with how proficient you are at your craft. Right. And that's where you can really start to embrace like your own voice and how Mm -hmm. you approach like a similar problem. And understanding that like how you approach someone's story is going to be special and that that's what you can really sell. Um, Right. So I I know that Julie like had a couple questions that she's waiting to ask and then I will ask the (laughs) remainder of mine. Sure. (laughs) Um, So as a part of the framework, of course, the hero encounters some sort of difficulty, a problem that Mm -hmm. they need to overcome, and the guide is there to help them through that. Um, So when you're writing your own... um, your own copy for your website or, you know, whatever. Um, How do you address the problem and fully show the problem without getting too negative um, Mm. and kind of bumming people out? (laughs) That's a great question. Uh, So if you think about it in story, right, um, what you don't want is you don't want a tragedy, right? Because a tragedy doesn't have a happy ending. A tragedy means there was a problem, the problem got worse and it got worse and it got worse and worse. And then people died. And And everybody died, right? (laughs) And it was like terrible and it made you cry, right? That's no good. What we want is we want a happy ending, obviously, right? So the nice thing is, is no matter how bad the the struggle is and how deep the depths are, as long as it has an equal reaction for happiness, or as long as you can illustrate clearly how your product or service helps that person avoid those bad things, then you'll be fine. So here's what happens is most people that I interact with, they think things are too negative when in reality, they're not even negative enough because if you don't address the problem, if the, if the hero can't see that you understand their problem, they don't think that you could solve their problem. They'll move right? on. Right. They'll move on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what I say is like negativity or, or failure or the problem, it's kind of like salt. If you don't have salt, it's bland. I don't want it. If you have too much salt in something, it's over powering and spit it out. But you have to clearly illustrate, here's the problem, and clearly illustrate how connect the dots between how your product or service solves that problem. And then you show them two things. You show them success, which is, hey, if you take this thing, if you do this thing, if you hire me, if you click buy now, that's going to give you this success and it's going to help you avoid failures like this right? And so think about any major Mm -hmm. commercial that's really, really good. It Mm -hmm. does a great job of telling you this is the potential problem you could face, but if you buy the product, you're going to face this success and you're going to avoid, like all states, great. You're going to avoid mayhem like me, right? (laughs) And they find a funny way of making the, I mean, the the guy's wrecking people's cars (laughs) and their lives and burning down houses. Like that's a funny way, but it shows the the, Mm -hmm. the problem. And they very clearly say, Go with Allstate to avoid mayhem like me, right? Yeah. And then when uh, when you've clearly like showed the problem mm-hmm. and showed the solution and you're you're ready to ask them to move forward with you, um, what do you think are some really um, strong calls to action specifically on your website? Yeah. I know that's something that I struggle with. Is or a, social media, like at the end of a post. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. yeah. you've just offered value. What are what are good calls to action? Yeah, yeah. 
Call to action. I love, thank you so much about asking call to action because so many times we're afraid to ask for the sale, right? Yeah, because we that don't used come to be me. Too, right? <laughs> and, and I resonate. I, I don't want to come across too salesy. Yeah. But the difference is when, when you haven't done a good job of really stepping in and saying, hey, I see that you have a problem. I have something here that's going to solve it. Would you like it? Like, that's not salesy. That's, I recognize your need. I have yeah. something to solve your problem and I'm willing to provide it for you. Would you like that? That's not salesy. It's when you come across and you go, I have the best thing and you need this and you're nothing without this. Like mm. that's, <laughs> those are salesy pieces, right? Or I need you yeah. know, 10 boss babes to join my company. And you know, like, no, <laughs> ah, you're not telling me how you're making my life mm -hmm. better with this product. So yeah. that's one thing. Second thing is specifically <laughs> when it comes to your website or when it comes to your digital space. Pretend it's a re retail space. I have to actually tell people, like, think it's a retail space and don't hide the cash register. I don't know if you've ever walked into any of those shops where, and you know, you're walking around, you've got your stuff and you're like looking, trying to figure out where do I pay? Where do I go to pay? Or That literally pay happened to me this weekend. I walked up to the wrong place and she's like, the register is over here. And I was like, I didn't know. <laughs> How was I supposed to know, right? Or you're in these situations where it's like there are people that I obviously want to give you money. How mm -hmm. can I give you money? And they make it difficult for you to give them money, you know, yeah. or in your emails, you'll just keep going. And it's like after line one or two on somebody, they go, yes, I'm sold. But you don't have a link that says contact me and they can't find it anywhere. It's like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm ready. And by the time you have to keep searching their website or searching their social media to figure out how to contact them, I'm done. So I would say that. So no, number one, you're not coming across salesy if you're actually solving a problem and providing value, right? Uh, number two, don't hide the cash register. So on your, on your website, and I know des most designers hate me for this, but I say <laughs> never go a full scroll without having your call to action button. The key it's is possible. there should also- It's possible right. to still make it look good. Sure, yeah. <laughs> right. And, and you should have one call to action not 10 calls to action, right? You don't want okay. 10 different things you want them to do. You want one call to action that's obvious, an obvious spot to click. So for those of you who are into like UX and all that sort of stuff, like that user experience, that user interface, you know it needs to be easy because if I don't see that button that says contact me, that says buy now, that says something very obvious, it's much easier for me to click the little red X in the corner than it is to scroll through and find things on your website. So yeah. Would you say, um, this is kind of a more specific yeah. follow-up question, but um for instance, if I had on my website, like I just finished explaining to people um, that their elopement day isn't going to be boring and impersonal, like mm -hmm. we can make it um, super tailored to them and authentic to them. And if I had something like, um, are you ready to plan your epic elopement day or something like that, is a question like that a little too ambiguous? Does it need to be a stronger call to action? Or do you think that's okay? I think that's okay uh, in support of the call to action. The okay. call to action should be the same everywhere on your website and it should be obvious what's going to happen when I click it. So if you said, Hey, are you ready to make sure that your elopement day goes off without a hitch? You know, so Larry, whatever you're going to say, that's great. Yeah. Uh, schedule an appointment now. Okay. It, it just be plain idea. about it. Schedule an appointment now. So schedule an appointment now, schedule an appointment now, schedule an appointment now. As I scroll, schedule an appointment now. That's what it should say that's going to go right to your scheduler. It, um, so in, in the book, I think they bring it up this way. But it, I call it the will you marry me button. Actually, Don calls it the will you marry me button, but I like to say it too. So, you know, imagine You're certified, that some, you can. Right, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> imagine somebody comes up to you and, you know, and wants to marry you and they say, they look at you and they say all the same things that these lame calls to action say. So like, Want to learn more? <laughs> like that? What? That's weird and creepy. It's like a, right? it's such a funny mental picture. Like I just see a guy on his one knee with the with the ring box yeah. open and going, <laughs> "Would you like to learn more? <laughs> Would you like to learn more? Want to start a conversation? No, you weirdo. You've got a ring right there. I've been waiting for months for you to pop the actual question. By the time you need to get down, I mean, so so really, by the time you need to get down on the metaphorical one knee and open up the box and say, "This is what I have for you. Will you marry me?" You have to make it plain and simple and you ask that question and it's a yes or no so it's schedule a call it's buy now it's book an appointment it's talk to brandy it's something that's obvious that lets me know what it is because if you say learn more i don't know what that means 
And don't get too cute because this is what cute, cute doesn't sell. Cute is confusing. Yeah. <laughs> if you go like, uh, if you go, you know, multiple different boxes that say different things that all go to the same spot. Hey, we should talk now. Don't wait. Let you know, like, don't add little cute things. Just make it simple and clear. obvious and clear what's going to happen. Awesome. Thank you. That, that's all really great answers about that. If you want to pull up your website, we can just look at it right now. I got time. <laughs> <laughs> maybe at the end we'll see yeah okay, okay, okay. we can we can always do like it would be super fun to do like a follow-up um yeah. and yeah and let you like do it live like show mm-hmm. like how this actually works that'd be really fun um i had kind of a couple follow-up questions as well so where where does the call to action differ on that same say that same website mm-hmm. with a um, like a freebie or something that you're trying, like a lead generator type thing, because that's not yeah. going to be a schedule a call. That's going to be, that's going to be different. So, how right. does that work if, within this ecosystem? That's a great question. So you have two different calls to action. I know I said there's one, but there's two different types. There's a direct call to action. Will you marry me? Very direct. That means we are done dating. It's time to cross that threshold. You can't That's, answer maybe to that. Right. There's no maybe. It's like, will you marry me? And um, this is probably what every guy would say or what I would say to every guy who's prospectively going to ask a woman. You don't ask the question unless you know the answer. Mm-hmm. Right? You know, right. Oh, Lord, you're, yes. you're not kind of gambling with this one unless you want to be on some Instagram fail. Right. you know, page. <laughs> so like by the time you say get book an appointment, you better be confident about what you've written there, right? You got to think that they're going to say yes. The other one is called a transitional call to action. This just keeps the relationship going. This is like, we're going to keep dating. This is, I need to get to know you a little bit more. And so those are the types of things where you're going to give them a PDF, where you're going to, you know, give them, uh, you're going to book a free consult, where you're going to do something like that. You're going to give them some sense of value that says, uh, you're going to give me some e- an email address and I'm going to give you some value right? That is a transitional. That way you can keep the relationship going because they're not ready yet to buy anything. So that's where the difference would be. You know, your, your, your quizzes, other things like that. By the way, if you ever do that online and you enter your email in for a quiz, that's so they can continue to market to you afterwards. If you do not in case you didn't already know that. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, Maybe you should tell your parents that. Like, right? That's probably oh my gosh. Uh, every, every week I get a call from my mother saying, right. I got this email. Yeah. No, so, don't open it. <laughs> Mom, just don't. But it says it's from Apple. It's not from Apple. Right. Yeah. So, okay. So this is actually something that I've been wondering personally. And okay. I can obviously ask this during our own sessions, but I thought it might be beneficial for the audience. So how do you sort of test a call to action on, on like a story or something on Instagram? Because on Instagram, I have found personally that it's not always schedule a call. Sometimes it's right. like... What do you have to offer this conversation we're having around the thing that's going on or the post that I just Mm -hmm. did that's maybe not – I don't necessarily want you to call me right now or schedule something. It's just like how how do you sort of test what what good call to action is, Mm -hmm. like an A-B testing sort of thing? Yeah. So the, I would say that the, the basis of your call to action, right, would be um, I need to know that by me – taking action, I'm going to get the solution to my problem. Mm. So a lot of times we do the wrong thing where, you know, cause I, I've written plenty of, of, uh, you know, social media copy where I'm trying to gain engagement. I want people mm-hmm. to talk to me. I want people right. to respond. But what I'm doing is I'm assuming that they want to answer that question. I'm assuming that, that, that by answering that question, it's providing them value. I'm assuming mm. that, that they want to do that one. Some people just don't, they don't want yeah. to, you know what I mean? So if you're saying, Hey, what do you think about this topic? But in reality, all you're doing is you're just collecting information for yourself or you're collecting information for your book or for right. your next PDF or for your next project. Like unless they're your friends or they just naturally like you, you're not going to gain engagement. But you know, you see that's where like, if you have a big following, like if you are an influencer and you're retweeting or you're resharing or you're sharing and commenting on, or you're saying, Hey, I'm going to select one of these comments and we're going to feature it on a podcast, right? Now you're seeing an exchange where if I participate in the discussion, I'm going to get something in return. So that's what I would say is the difference is step back and look, is this thing that I'm asking them to do something that's for them or is it for me? 
or do I think it's for them and it's really not because I'm making some assumption they actually want to do this, right? Yeah. Well, and I guess I would say, and again, this is all this is all very self-serving at the moment, but I think that it's sure. I think it's valuable. I feel like when you're just trying to get people to engage, yes, it is so that like you get good engagement, right? So that your post mm-hmm. gets shown more, but also yeah. I genuinely like want to talk to my audience. So like right. I'm constantly asking different versions of of like the same question or like right. a number of different questions and it's really hard to gauge like is there is there like a set copy trick to like understanding the kinds of things that people will want to answer as them being the hero like how do mm. we make the questions about them without sounding like we're just trying to pry them open for it, personal information you know what does that make sense uh, yeah, I think so. I think what I would say to that is like, you know, so this is pulling in a little bit of like some Gary V interactions as well too, but it's going to take time to build. Right. And so like what I really appreciate about what I've seen from you, Brandy is like, you know, me personally, and I responded to one of your, your polls or, you know, one of your questions and you'll do a, have a personal response for me. And I'm like, I wasn't expecting that, but you know, like if you're going to be someone of influence or someone that's providing value, it is a little bit of that, you know, jab, 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 right hook, like Mm -hmm. Gary Vee would talk about or continuing, um, continuing that interaction engagement. So rewarding people who actually answer your question Mm -hmm. is going to help more people answer the question. So it's a snowball that builds. So I ask a question, maybe I only get one person that answers and it's my mom, right? I'm going (laughs) to respond to her and I'm going to use her thing and say, Hey, I had a follow follower uh, that or one of you, you know, somebody in the, in the design speaks world uh, said this. And so now I'm using that. And now it cues in people's brains go, Oh, if I comment, maybe my comments going to get used. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, then they take that step and they comment in and now it's, you're responding to them. So now if I comment, my comment might get used, but it'll definitely get a personal response. Oh, okay. I'm getting something. I'm getting something. I'm getting something. So I think it's, it's following up your intention with actual action. So if you're saying, I do, I I do that with everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I said. Like, so if you're saying this is actually for your benefit, right. That I want to know because I want to hear from you because I want to hear from the audience, Mm -hmm. your actions afterwards have to have to prove that um, on social media. And that's really going to help people. So it's less about like the questions that you're asking and it's more, what do Mm -hmm. you do after that? Whether you get answers or not. Right. Yeah. I mean, on the front end, again, on the front end, are the questions you have to realize, like, are the questions by them answering it, is that going to solve a problem for them? Okay. That's the front end to formulate the the question. (laughs) Yeah. Right. The motivation for it. And then on the back end, it's what am I doing to follow up to let them know that I'm actually positioned as the guide and I'm not positioned as the hero just tossing out questions. Totally. That's really helpful. Yeah. Um, I think Julie had a question about copy too. Okay. Um, I think I asked most of them, but just kind of a more general question is, if, do you have any tips for somebody who is kind of DIYing this? Um, they've read the book and gone through the framework, and now they're ready to start writing the copy. Yeah, so if you're going to write copy on a website, that's a that's a key one. Okay, so let's say you've read the book. Um, there's plenty of free resources like on YouTube. If you search Story Brand, you could see there's a couple of business made simple things that Donald Miller puts out and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, Let me see. Which, by the way, like subscribe to his all of emails. his emails. Subscribe all to all. Don't of open his any emails, emails <laughs> except for his because they're yeah. always full of value and so so helpful. And like, listen to the podcast, watch his YouTube videos, just. Take it all in. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. So he awful. has lots of he, he's obviously the master of this, but I like too that that things are short. Yes. You don't have to sit in front of the computer Easy for an to hour digest. to get the value. <laughs> yeah. So that totally. that would be the thing is you subscribe. So like you see on other people's websites, they have an opt-in somehow, you know, or download this resource for your email. If it's somebody that you like and respect, do that. And then open those emails and study them. I would also say that Ray yeah. Edwards has a great book, right? Mm-hmm. How to write copy that sells. This is awesome. And then Lee Lefevre is a guy I talked about before, The Art of Explanation. This helps you get things okay. really concise. But those are two awesome. great things. Um, obviously, if you're not like a writer and you're not going to make this like your full-time thing, you can always talk to a guide, a little self-serving here. You know, you can hire yeah. a guide who's <laughs> going to help you away. with that. Uh, that would be the thing. I mean, honestly, I subscribe to political candidates and I subscribe to their email addresses. And uh, as disgusting as some of them are at the same time, if you read and dissect them, you go, 
Oh, I see what you're doing. <laughs> I see yeah. <laughs> what you're doing. I see that you're getting a ton of people that have no idea that you're tricking their brains into donating or into buying the thing. And it's all in the language that you want to use. And that helps you understand, okay, how do I feel about this particular person or brand this way? How are they talking about themselves this way? Do I want to align myself with the way that they're portraying themselves? Well, no. Okay. Then don't use those words, but understand how they're doing it. So really you can work through that. The other thing that I'll, the free tip I'll give you is search pastor, P A S T O R the pastor framework. That is a great just starter that if you just look for that acronym, it'll walk you through P A S T O R a six part framework for writing an email for writing something like that, that you can actually walk through that it goes along with the story brand framework, but it's, it's a great way to write like a, a sales letter or a good email. As far as a website awesome. is concerned, this is what I would say. And especially for creatives and designers is we get into things that look cute. Um, but you have to separate that out. You have to separate mm -hmm. what kind of design do I like and what's effective because yeah. When you think through what are the websites that I actually use and click, um, most of the time they'll be following a similar framework to the story brand framework. They're not going to be following the best design things or, uh -huh. you know, what like something new and fancy. Yes. <laughs> yes. Again, cute is sometimes the opposite of clear and you want clear because if you don't have clarity, clarity is the, is the, is the, the thing that's going to solve everything because confusion will make sure that your prospective client will go to someone else. Cause again, they're not looking for the best product or service. They're looking for the person or the product or the service that is easiest to understand. So I get this all the time too with clients where they say, well, doesn't this seem kind of basic? Am I just explaining the same thing that everybody else that I do does? It's like, yes, but you're explaining it in a way that's easy to understand. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if it's easy to understand, they're going to go for it. So, I mean, yeah. think about any restaurant you go to. That's why they list uh, like McDonald's now. They don't show you everything on the menu. They show you the most popular things and the things they want you to buy at that particular time. Mm -hmm. So you can order yeah. things that aren't on the menu, but they want to make it as easy as possible for you to see burger, buy burger, right? That's it. So figure yeah. out what is the problem that you solve? What do you want to sell? And use that. So if you like to sell uh, senior photo packages and not wedding photo packages, talk about your senior photo packages. If you want to only talk to brides, talk about that. If you only want to do event photography, do that. Like it seems so simple, but because we want to get cute and because we want to throw everything in there and make, you know, some yeah. website stew and mm -hmm. stir it around, <laughs> it's, it's no good. I yeah. kind of rambled there. Sorry. About no, that. I love no, it. That's okay. That's all, great. It's all valuable. I just get on my soapbox. You know? That's okay. <laughs> We're happy about it. So we will yes. definitely have you on here again, whether it's like a bonus episode to talk through sure. maybe an actual walkthrough of maybe Julie and I's websites. I mine is pretty much done, but that way we can kind of like let people kind of see maybe mm -hmm. what we did and look through Julie's and see what maybe questions she has. But well, here's something for you to consider. Yeah. I'm putting you on the spot. But if you want to offer to your listeners, I will go through one to three websites from your listeners if you want to provide value for them as well. You heard it here first, awesome. folks. Amazing. <laughs> Story brand expert Eric Williams is offering three – Look, what, what do you call them? Analysis? We, yeah, we call them website reviews. We just website go through – and it takes about five to 10 minutes and we just scroll through the website and we say all the things that, that are working and provide on, you know, on the spot, off the cuff feedback to what should be changed. And the nice thing is when you see a couple of other websites being reviewed, it helps you identify some mm -hmm. of the com yeah. common problems in your own website. Awesome. Hey, that's really great. Thank you so much for offering that. If you guys are interested in that, just email hello at designspeakspodcast.com and um, I will put you in touch with Eric and... We are just we'll about hitting the end here of our time, but what other what other things do you have to say about yourself? Where can people find you? All that good stuff. Well, okay. So if you're looking for a new website, if you're looking just to clarify what it is that you do, or maybe any of these questions came up and you said, well, I don't really understand the problem that I'm solving for people because I'm just like a designer and I just take photos, whatever that happens to be. Um, 
you could go to 212consultingservices.com, 212consultingservices.com, the number 212consultingservices.com. And uh, you can go ahead and reach out and we can schedule a free 30 minute uh, evaluation, just kind of talk through some of the things that you're looking for. But what I love to do is I love to help individual entrepreneurs, businesses to uh, clarify what it is that they do and help them really do what they do better. So if you're having a hard time talking about what it is that you do, you need a new website, you just need some copy, or you just need an outside voice to help get you going, let me know. I promise at the end of the 30 minutes, you will be like just waiting to give him your money and do more minutes. So (laughs) (laughs) Um, thank you so much, Eric, for being here. I look forward to more conversations with you and um, our listeners, I hope aren't going to drown in all the amazing value that you offered today, but hopefully in a good way if they do. (laughs) Thank you. We'll see you later. Bye. Well, Julie. Yes. The power of story and guiding people through a journey is so important. And it can really change how you approach your business and your design work. And um, I think we probably easily could have talked to Eric for like two more hours. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we will we will for sure have him back. I think that a lot of what we do here wraps around story, wraps around yeah this whole framework, and so it will be for sure beneficial for everyone. And now that we're doing video, we can do things like video walkthroughs yes. of like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited about yeah, that. <laughs> so we're gonna like hang up and schedule that right now. All right, everyone, that's our episode for today. If you would like to support us please visit patreon.com slash design speaks podcast. Eric Williams actually offered for the next five supporters that become patrons on Patreon to offer them a free uh, web review of your website um, from the story brand framework kind of point of view to tell you what's working, what's not. So that's a pretty limited offer, but we're super grateful to have him do that. So if you are interested in that, visit us at patreon.com slash design speaks podcast or you can email us hello at design speaks podcast.com as always you can find all of our episodes past present and future on design speaks podcast.com and check us out on instagram so we will see you guys next week we don't care where we want